During worship, uh, the Lord gave me a vision for this church. I saw heavenly waters being let loose, so to speak, and flowing down from hills around this church towards you and over this city. So there's a new anointing coming for you guys. There's a new anointing coming for you to step into and minister for the Lord in this area. So I bless you guys to do that. Uh, before I continue, we have a book at the table written by my beautiful wife and her late husband, Isabel and Ivan. And uh, it's available there in the back, just so you know. And uh, yeah, do you mind if I give this to you? It's a gift from God. Bless you. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about, first I would like to introduce myself, telling you a little bit about who I am and how I became <clears throat> to know, how I came to know the Lord. It was many, many years ago, 30-something years ago, which is really strange because I'm only 45. <laughs> oh, thou shalt not lie, says, you know, yeah, I forgot that one. <laughs> no, <laughs> but a good friend of mine, I was raised as a uh, Protestant, Lutheran Protestant. I went to um, Sunday school now and then, and, uh, but I didn't know what it was to be saved or be born again. I didn't even know that ex it ex existed. So a good friend of mine, he got saved and uh, started telling me about that, and I thought he was crazy. And uh, he was telling me about all kinds of things about Jesus and all, all kinds of stuff that he knew him, he had met him and all that. And I, like I said, I thought he was crazy. I thought he, was, uh, he had probably eaten some bad mushrooms or something. <laughs> but knowing this man and seeing the change in him made me think. So I looked at him and there was something new in his eyes. He had something that he did not have before. And I was always trying to ask him questions. I thought, okay, he's coming this weekend for a visit. I'm going to prepare very, very well, ask him some really strange, difficult questions that he will probably not be able to answer. And when I thought I had cornered him and I, was, I thought I was very smart, and I asked him something that I knew he couldn't answer, he just looked at me and said, Thrawen, I don't know but I know what I have. So for me, that was a big thing. Oh, he doesn't feel that he has to, uh, he has to answer every question or he has to protect what he has. It protects itself. Yeah. So I decided to look, start looking. So I gathered a few books and started reading. And uh, all of those books were about people who had gotten saved and were telling stories about how they got saved. So uh, I decided to pray. They all had this in common, pray the prayer of salvation. So I said to myself, if it's there, I want it. Yeah. If it's not there, I want to know it's not there. So I've got nothing to lose. So I prayed and prayed the prayer of salvation, and nothing happened. So I got a little bit frustrated, and I prayed and prayed again and again and again, and nothing happened. So I was starting to think maybe I was right, maybe there's nothing there. But something within me kept on pushing me to pray. At that time, I was a sailor. I was working on a ship, sailing on a ship. And at one moment, after my, uh, when I had, my shift had ended, I went to my cabin to go to sleep. I went to bed and I decided to pray once more. And uh, then I remembered that verse that says, and you have to believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead. Mm. Then I realized I hadn't believed. So I made a conscious decision to believe. I just said to myself, now I am going to believe, and I'm going to pray. Mm. And I prayed again, believing. Then someone walked through the door into my cabin on the ship, and my room got filled with a presence of peace and of love 
that I've never ever felt before in my life. Physically, I could feel someone laying on top of me, embracing me, and I heard these words, Thrawin, I love you just the way you are. That's the day I met Jesus. Beautiful. That's the day I met Jesus of the Bible. That's the day I met my Jesus. And this was not a single occurrence in my life. This has happened many, many times since that he has come and hugged me. Beautiful. Just about a month ago or so, maybe one and a half month ago, one and a half month ago or something like that, I was home, back home in Canada. I was feeling a little bit low. I felt uh, lonely. I don't know why I felt abandoned. I felt that God wasn't there with me. Uh, I'm probably the only one who's ever felt like that. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, as I stood in my bedroom, a cloud started appearing in front of me a small cloud, mm -hmm. like the size of a baseball or a little bit bigger, then another one and another one and another one, and they were all around me in my bedroom. I could touch them. As I touched them, they felt like silk, mm -hmm. but much smoother, and they were pure white, and I could touch them. And then all of a sudden, a bigger cloud appeared in front of me, and I could see a man in that cloud. I could see the back of someone. And then that man turned around and it was Jesus. And he looked at me and he came and hugged me. That's my Jesus. Yeah. That's the Jesus of the Bible. You know, the, <clears throat> the reason I didn't understand at first why he turned his back at me but now I know it, it was because he was showing me this is the way you have been feeling. But when he turned around, this is reality. Yeah. It's not about how we feel. It's about who he is. Yeah. Yeah. And what the word of God says, who he is. Right. Our feelings have nothing to do with it. It doesn't matter how I feel. Mm -hmm. That does not change God. And he is always with you, no matter what you're going through, however you feel, what's going on in your life, he will never ever abandon you. I can only abandon him, but he has promised in his word that he will never abandon me. So sometimes through all of this through the walk of life, sometimes we tend to look upon ourselves, not only with small eyes, but sometimes we look at ourselves as I'm worth nothing. I can't do this and all kinds of negative thoughts about ourselves. And often we get to that place in life because something has happened to us. We had gone through something. We were raised in a certain way. We were treated in a certain way. And that gives us a bad image of ourselves. So, uh, you know, maybe we have bad memories of, you know, when I was a kid, I fell on my bicycle, hurt myself, cried, and all of that. And after that, maybe when I saw that bicycle, it gave me a bad memory, which hurt me. Or if you had a dollhouse, I didn't have a dollhouse. But if, <laughs> if you had a doll, our granddaughter, she has a doll. Oh, she's so lovely. We love her so much. You know, I was a, a, a sidetrack here. Sorry, a sidetrack. We were teaching on, we were teaching in the School of Ministry in Toronto. We were, I was teaching on fellowship and loving Jesus Christ. Mm. And, uh, you know, being a friend of Jesus and loving him. At the same moment, I was teaching that. My three-year-old granddaughter was in kindergarten at the exact same moment in Iceland. And they were having their afternoon snack. And she stood up in the middle of everyone there, raised her hands, and said out loud, 
I love Jesus and he is my friend. Three-year-old. She's only once been in Sunday school. It's exact moment I was teaching on that in Toronto. The Bible says that the blessings of the fathers go down to the children of generation of generations. Like the Bible te talks about curses can go from generation to generation, so do the blessings. Yeah. So fathers, take your position in front of God. Take your positions as leaders of your home and leaders of your family and the blessings that come because of your relationship with the Lord go over your family. Amen. Mothers, if the fathers do not take the positions, but you do, I believe the blessings go from you over the family. So take our position before God. Yes. So often when we look at ourselves like, you know, I'm not worth anything or this is impossible, it's like, you know, in, the, in my garage, there's a lot of junk. <laughs> Amen? Amen? That's really spiritual, isn't it? Yeah. In my garage, there's a lot of junk. Old stuff in the corner piling up, which I have gathered there from throughout the years, and uh, many of us have, have that. I think it's only in Iceland, not in America, but... But if you, you know, when I look at this and I say, okay, it's time to rent a U-Haul and take some stuff to the dump. And I look in, in, into the pile and I see a lot of junk and, oh, there's my bicycle that hurt me. Oh, there's this that uh, hurt me when I was a kid. Oh, that's from my, you know, that relationship that hurt me or whatever. Just throw it all away. But Jesus... He wants to take that pile of junk and make it into gold. Yes, yes. In my life, all those hurts in my personal life, he wants to take it and he sees the gold in it. For me, it's junk that hurt me. I want it out of my life. I want to throw it away. But the Lord wants to take it and make it work for us for good. So sometimes I pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, more of you, more of you, more of you in my life. You know what he said to me once? Yes, Trawin, but there's a room for me. I want to be a bigger part of your life, but is there a room, more room for me in your life? Have I made more room for the Holy Spirit in my life? Like, have I cleaned out the garage to make more room? So then I realized I need to, to clean out my garage. So, you know, let's look at the good, let's look at the good things in life. Let's look at, see, try to see ourselves the way Jesus sees us. I've once heard a parable, it was, uh, you know, if you see a painting and you look and someone is standing beside me and I'm looking at that painting and I say, wow, this is an ugly painting. This is horrible. I've never seen anything as disgusting as this. Okay. But the person standing beside me is the painter. How do you think he feels? Yeah. Okay, the guy who made the painting, how do you think he feels? Well, if I stand in front of the mirror in the morning and I say, wow, I am ugly, I am horrible, I am worthless, nobody wants me, I'm a failure, God made a mistake when he created me, remember this, the Holy Spirit is standing beside you. The one who created you he is there, and he is listening to you, belittling his creation. Who am I to talk to myself like that when I am the creation of God? Who am I to hurt the Holy Spirit like that, talking like that to myself and about myself? Don't quench the Holy Spirit. 
Don't hurt him. He has feelings and he loves you. So don't talk badly about yourself. You are trashing the creation of God if you do that. Accept who you are, the perfect creation of God himself. He never makes mistakes, ever. You know, it's like um, I heard a story of a young man. He was a young man, and he fell in love with a young woman. And he was deeply, deeply in love. Anyone ever been in love here? It's a great feeling, isn't it? He was deeply in love with his girlfriend, and he decided he wanted to marry her. But he didn't have money. He was uh, in school, so he was working on the weekends. He had a job on the side, and he was saving money to buy a ring, to buy an engagement ring. And he saved and saved and saved, and finally he could buy the ring he wanted to give her. It was a very expensive ring. But the thing was, he didn't have much money to buy the box for the ring. So for that beautiful ring, he bought a, uh, just an old, simple, beaten box to put the ring in. And then he took her for a drive to their favorite place where he was going to propose. And they, they stopped. He took her out of the car looking at the stars, and it was in the evening. And he went down on his knees to propose, took out the box and opened it and showed her the ring and asked her to marry her. And she looked at that beautiful ring, and then she said, oh man, that's an ugly box. That was her response. That's an ugly box. She only saw the negative things. She didn't see the gold in what was going on. How often do we, or me, or many of us, respond like that? We only see the negative things. We only see what we, we don't see the good things. We don't see the positive things. We don't see the beauty. When it comes to ourselves, when it comes to our neighbor, mm. when it comes to our situation, there's always something to be thankful for. Yeah. There's always something beautiful to be thankful for. So let us focus on the rose and not on the thorns. Amen. Let us focus on the good things in life. Let us focus on him and thank him. You know, the Bible says that um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, and I'm re reading from the New Life tra Translation, it says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. That's, that's my favorite part of these verses. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. So because of his love for us and the comfort that he has given us throughout our lives, we are able to comfort others. You know... I was once, how, how God works beautifully sometimes. I was once in Pakistan, ministering in Pakistan, and uh, I was, gave an altar call. People came up to get prayer. And there was a woman that came to me, and she had ha held a bowl in her hand. And there was something in that bowl, like it was like a, a pudding or something. And yet, yeah, just to give you a little background, I asked the pastor where I was ministering, I asked him, Please do not tell me anything what happens while I'm ministering. Please don't ask anyone. Just wait two weeks. Wait for two weeks, then ask the people what happened. And please write it down and send me an email. I do not want to know anything in the first few days because sometimes some Christians, I know you don't do that, some Christians we tend to exaggerate things and we tend to go you know hype up things in the in the flesh instead of in the spirit i know it's, it doesn't happen here i know that 
<laughs> so that's the reason I asked him, in two weeks. Okay, so he sent me an email in two weeks. Okay, so this woman came up and she asked me to bless this bowl. And I said, well, what? Okay, I'll, I'll bless the bowl. I, I, you don't say no. So I just I bless this bowl in Jesus' name. And then a young boy came with a bottle of water like this one and asked me, to, can you bless this water for me? Sure, I bless the water. One of the things that email said two weeks later was uh, that the bowl was food for a cow. That woman had a cow that was sick. And she took that bowl back and gave the cow and the cow got healed. Wow. And I said to the Lord a little bit angry like, Jonah, why are you healing a cow? What's going on? Do you send me to Pakistan to heal a cow? And he said to me, Thrawin, this woman is my daughter. And that cow is her livelihood. And that cow had stopped milking. And she asked me for help. And I healed her cow. Because she is mine, that woman, and that's her livelihood. And then he said to me, Thrawin, if you would lose your job, and you needed a new job, because you had, you had to have your livelihood, I would give you a new job. So that's why he healed the cow. Yeah. That's Jesus of the Bible. Yeah. That's our Lord. He cares for everyone and everything. And that young boy who came with a bottle of water, took it home, and his father, who was diabetic, drank it and got healed. That's our Jesus. Yes. That's my Jesus. Yes. And you know, I am nothing special. It has nothing to do with me. It's our Lord Jesus Christ who does that. And he is looking for people that he can use, that he can send. Who wants to go? Who wants to minister for him? You know, we don't... It's not about, you know, I'm not qualified, I can't do this, I don't have what it takes, and blah, blah. I don't have anything. I don't have anything. I don't have nothing what it takes. He gives you everything you need. And he can use you in any way he chooses. You know, I was in Thailand once ministering. They have a lot of home churches there. And I was... Um, I was in one of the home churches, and uh, when I came, there was a man there who looked at me very strangely. He was always looking at me and looking at me and pointing at me and whispering to the people. I, I felt a little bit, I was looking, is my fly open or something? <laughs> what's going on? And, uh, and then I asked someone, what's going on? And then they told me, this man, he was, actually, he was obviously crippled in a way. He, 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 he walked very strangely. He was a bus driver. He was a Buddhist. A bus, a, a truck driver had a serious accident some years ago, and he was in a coma for five years after the accident. And I got very skeptical of oh, five years. Okay, give me a break. I got to look into that. Having a, a little bit of a medical background myself, but it actually can happen. It's rare, but it can happen that people are in a coma for that long. And that man said, in the coma, as a Buddhist, a man came walking to me, holding the Bible, reaching out and saying to me, believe in this and you will live. And then I woke up from a coma. And then he pointed at me and said, this is the man who came in the coma. This is the man who came to me in the coma with the Bible. I said, no, that can't be. I wasn't there. But I was there. Yeah. Yeah. Even though I, I didn't know I was there, but I was there. The Lord can use you any way he pleases. Yeah. You know, your spirit never sleeps. Mm -hmm. Our body sleeps, our soul is resting, but our spirit never sleeps. So the Lord can use you in any way he chooses, but he is asking who will go? Who wants to go? Who is willing? So there are no limitations for any one of us. 
as long as we follow him and we give ourselves wholeheartedly to him. And that's our Lord Jesus. That's the Jesus of the Bible. He is he's the God of miracles. And he's working today. It's the same today, yesterday, and forever. I wasn't going to tell these stories. I was going to read some verses. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> it says in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 22, And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over the things to the church, which is his body. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. We know this. Jesus is the head of the church. So all our body depends, basically, if you look at it from a physical point of view, our body depends on our head. It is where we get our information from. I mean, about growing, finding nourishment, to function normally, all of this comes from the head. And in the brain, from the brain, we have our nerve system going out to our limbs and all, throughout all the body. So this is a great way for the Lord, for, for, for us to understand how the church should function having him as a head. So... It also says in Colossians, Colossians 2, 8 and 19, don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels saying they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud and they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body. For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments and it grows as God nourishes it. So when we disconnect ourselves from the head, or with the head, we disconnect ourselves with the head, it becomes very easy to lead us astray, lead us away from the truth, lead us into alleys we shouldn't be going into, to deception and teachings that are contrary to God's word. You know, we should... I would like to put emphasis on one thing. Know the word of God. Yes, yes. Know the word of God. It's really easy to go into deception, yes. wrong beliefs, if we don't know the word of God. You know, the Lord never speaks, contradict, or he never contradicts his word when he speaks. It's like if you are, you know, you can be super spiritual, I don't like spiritual people. Ooh, everything is prophetic. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, the time, it's, it's 2.38. Oh, it happens twice a day. <laughs> it's a sign from God. It's prophetic. Okay. That's the prophetic people, how they behave sometimes. <laughs> or you can, or you, or you see the... The evangelists, why are you sitting in here? Why don't you go outside and run all over and get people saved and stuff like that? We get super spiritual. It's like the eagle who is flying with one wing. He flies in circles. Because I am so super spiritual, I'm only functioning in the spirit. Or when you meet people who know the word, inside and out, they can quote every scripture in the book but they don't know the author. They've never met the author, but they know the book inside and out. Usually they are legalistic. And they have the other wing, flying in circles. So it has to be a balance. We have to have both wings out there. Know the word, know the author. If we don't, it's really easy to be led astray or bad teachings or whatnot. So always 
be connected to the head of the church, to, to our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes I think that, uh, or people think, I'm one of them sometimes, uh, when I'm hurting, nobody cares, nobody sees me. Uh, I don't, you know, nobody, I'm invisible if I'm hurting. Who has ever hurt his small toe? Have you kicked something, a radiator or something at the wall and, or a stone and, ow, it's really painful, isn't it? Sometimes I say, oh, I'm just a small part in the church. I'm just like the little finger or the little toe. Or who am I? But the brain, the nerves going from the brain, they sense the pain. Jesus senses your pain because he is the head of the church and everyone matters in the church he will never ever abandon you no matter what we think or how we feel so i would like to encourage us all of us to never lose sight of him in our lives be it the church, be it the family, be it our marriage, our children, always, always have him as a head of everything in our life. You know, there's, the way he created us is so perfect. Just see, just take marriage, for example. How he created marriage. He took a rib out of the man and made a woman. How cool is that? For me, that means that the man is constantly looking for his missing rib. Yeah. That's why we guys want to get married. That's why we want to have girlfriends, because there's something missing in our life. And the rib is constantly looking for the man where it came from by God. The woman is looking for a husband because that's how God intended it to be because they belong together. And the reason God took the rib is because the rib is close to the man's heart. And the man is supposed to protect his wife because the rib is underneath his arm, isn't it? He didn't take a bone from the skull because he's not supposed to dominate over the wife. He didn't take a bone from his feet because he's not supposed to stomp on his wife. You see, everything is perfect that the Lord does. Yes. Everything is perfect. And he created man first because the individual is supposed to have a relationship with God first before anything else. And then he created woman or marriage. And then family, children. Then came the church, and then came the ministry. Mm -hmm. So let us not miss out and do it the wrong way. Right. Let's not skip one or the other. So if I'm in front of God, praying and seeking his face, and then I jump over my marriage to the church part, and then I want to minister, something is really wrong in my life. It will not bear fruit for a long time, a long-lasting fruit, because I'm skipping one or two steps in the way God has intended us to live. So husbands, if you want your children to be happy, love your wives first. Because if mommy is happy, the children are happy. Yeah. <laughs> Wives, if you want your children to be happy, love your husbands first. Because if daddy is happy, the kids are happy. It took me quite some time, some decades to understand this. The reason God creates, the reason God creates things in this way in a certain way, this way or the other way. But he always, he is perfect and everything he does is perfect.
You know, my daughter, she was, uh, I love telling this story. It shows the goodness of God. My, my daughter is very prophetic. She doesn't want to be. She's running away from it. But sometimes she prophesies over my wife. She calls and tells her what's going on and what she's thinking even. And sometimes she, he, she calls me and, and uh, tells me the truth <laughs> when I need to hear it. You know, she was once going, ho going home in her small car, bad weather, raining outside. She was a student at that time. And she was driving on a, uh, it was dark, rainy, and it was a four-lane road, two lanes each way. And on the opposite side, there was a man walking in the rain in the dark, alone. And the Holy Spirit said to her, stop the car, turn around, and pick him up. She said, no. Kept on driving. The Holy Spirit said for the second time, stop the car, turn around, pick him up. No. She gets that from me. The stubbornness. <laughs> and uh, for the third time, the Holy Spirit said to her, stop the car, turn around, and pick him up. And she said, well, I don't have, I'm, I'm really running out of gas. I'm running out of gas. I don't have any money for gas. I'm just a poor student. He may be a killer. He may be a criminal. And I don't know who he is. And I'm not going to pick him up. And kept on driving. And then the Holy Spirit said, her name is Björk. Björk, stop the car, turn around, and pick him up. She said, OK. And then she turned around, drove to that man, picked him up. And as he sat in the car, she realized he was a foreigner from Poland. And he said, I've been in Iceland for either, I think it was three or six weeks. And he said, nobody has ever, ever done anything for me or thought any or talked to me any kind, in a kind, kind way or anything. And she said, well, okay. And she's, when she started driving him home, she, she looked at the fuel gauge in the car, and the needle on the fuel gauge started rising. Wow. So the gasoline in the car increased as she was driving him home. That's the Lord. Yes. That's the Lord. That's the Jesus that we know. That's the Jesus of the Bible. He will never ask you to go or do anything unless he will equip you to do it unless he will equip you to do it. In this instance, she needed gasoline. She got it in a miraculous way. I have stories about my son as well, how he saved his life, and uh, how he is always with us. Only if we follow him and say, yes, Lord, I used to wait after I got saved pretty early on, I had never had visions or dreams or anything spiritual before I got saved. Oh, once I saw a demon before I got saved, but I have never ever, apart from never ever had any spiritual experiences before I got saved. But God revealed himself in a miraculous way and has been and still is. He said, are you willing to go? Who is willing to go? Who is willing to give, lay down your life for, for him? Who is willing to do that? And he will give you everything you need. And I was waiting and waiting and waiting for years and years and years. I knew I was called to full-time ministry. I knew I was supposed to go and do something for the Lord. And I always waited, waited, waited. I was waiting for the Lord to ring my doorbell and blow a trumpet on my doorsteps and say, Thrawn, it's time to go. It never happened. But when I went, mm. then it happened. Yeah. I just decided now it's time to go. And I just went. When he started giving me words to prophesy for people, he told me, Thrawn, go to that person over there. I want you. I have a word for that person. I want you to give that person the word. I said, sure. What's the word? I'll go. You know what he said? I'm not the God that gossip. <laughs> what? I'm not going to tell you the word if you're not going to go. So why should he tell me the word if I'm not going to go? Then he's gossiping. I'm not the God that gossip. 
So he was basically testing my faith. So when you go, he, those, these signs will follow. These signs will follow those. So be bold, step yes, out, yes. trust in him. Amen. He will be with you. He is with you already, and he will be with you. You know, I once prophesied naked over a naked man. <laughs> now my wife said, oh my gosh. <laughs> no, honestly, I was naked and I prophesied over a naked man. Has anyone done that? <laughs> I know it sounds horrible, but I love the way it sounds and I like to wait a little bit, let you gets all sorts of mental pictures. <laughs> now the thing is, I was in the gym, and I didn't obey. And there was a man, another man in the gym, and the Lord told me, go to that man and say this to him. Go to that man, and I have a word for him, and this is the basis of the word. This is what this, it is about. So go and start, and I will give you what you need. And this man was the most known criminal in Iceland at that time. He was known for hurting people, physically hurting people. I said, no, 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 I can't do that. He's going to kill me. He's going to beat me up. <laughs> yeah. So I pushed that away, but I didn't have that peace in my heart. It was pounding, pounding, pounding. And, but I pushed it away, pushed it away, pushed it away. And then I said, oh, I'm, I'm just going to push it away completely. And I went down to the locker room and to change and go into the showers. Were, this was a gym with big showers. It probably could have taken in those showers probably 50 or 60 individuals at the same time. So I was standing in the showers and there was no one there. All of a sudden this guy comes. And we were the only two guys in the showers, which is very, very rare. And I thought, boom, 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 my heart. So I knew there's no escaping. I have to do this. I have to obey. Because this is really important for this man. If I don't obey, I am robbing this man of a blessing. Right. And I'm letting God down. So I went to him. I prophesied over him. And he was really encouraged. And I said to, I, I, I said to him first, I, I, I hope you don't mind. I'm a Christian. And I believe I, I hear from God sometimes. I believe I have a word for you from God. I hope you don't mind. Well, well no, no, okay, go on. <laughs> and I gave him the word, and he said, well, well, who can be angry because of hearing a thing like this? Today, he is one of the most active evangelists in Iceland. Wow. This man. Yeah. So that's the day I prophesied naked over a naked man. And the reason I did this, did that was my fault. I didn't obey when the Lord told me to. Yeah. I tried to push it away so the Lord, in a sense, cornered me. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that's a way to humble me. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, so we should obey. We should obey. Be bold. Be courageous. And be willing to make mistakes. I have, I have, I'm probably the world champion in making mistakes. I have made so many mistakes along the way that I will probably never meet the person who makes as many mistakes as I have. But I've always stood up again and kept on going. Sometimes it's taken me longer, a longer time to stand up again, but keep on going. Because how are you going to know when you are right, if you're going to minister in the prophetic, how are you going to know when you are right, hearing from God, if you have never been wrong? If you don't know how to be wrong, how are you going to distinguish between right and wrong? So be bold and be willing to step out and take a chance. The measurement I use myself, if I'm not sure, if I feel that I'm getting a word from God or something like that, or I have a, yeah, I want to give a word to someone, 
I feel I'm supposed to do that. The measurement I use is this. If I am wrong and the word I'm giving will not hurt the person, I will say it. Because if I'm wrong, I will look like a fool. That's okay. I can always apologize, repent, and keep on going. But if I don't say it, and I was right, I may be robbing that person of a blessing. So who am I to rob someone of a blessing from the Lord? But if I am not sure, and the word I'm going to give may be hurtful if I'm wrong, then I won't say it. Because I'm not going to take the chance on hurting someone because I'm not sure. Then I'm doing the wrong thing. Always, always consult with your pastors. Always, always come under the authority of your pastors in your church. It has nothing to do with your pastors per se. It's the biblical thing to do. If you're not sure, ask them to pray with you. You know, once the Lord told me there is a pedophile coming into your church and he's going to be like a predator and uh, I was really, really scared. I went straight to the pastors and told them. At that point, there were two new people coming to take over the children's ministry in the church and I was convinced it was them. I was convinced. But thank God I went to the pastors and we prayed together and they said, no, we don't, we don't, think, that, that's, we don't think that's right. We don't think they are the ones you're talking about the Lord is warning us about. But I was watching them when they came. Believe you me, I was watching them, yeah. But I was wrong. It wasn't them. Sometime later, a few months later, a convicted sex offender came to the church, preying on the women. Immediately, he was spotted and removed from the church. God had given a word of warning to protect the sheep in the church. Yes. The way it is handled when God gives that word is really, really important. Do not jump to conclusions. Get people to pray for you, pray with you, Consult with your pastors. That's why we have the fivefold ministry for protection of the church. For protection of the church. I'm going to end with this. Once I was, we were soaking in the church and I was praying for people. We, people were laying on the floor and going around and touching people's shoulders or their feet while I pray for them silently. And I touched the foot of a woman, a young woman, and I saw a child. She was obviously not Icelandic. She was from a country in South America. And I saw a small child running alone on a beach in diapers, all alone. And I saw the woman crying, crying, crying. And I saw Jesus come in the vision, touching her heart with his fingers, with healing anointing. And I could feel the sorrow in this woman's heart. That's quite a vision. What does this vision mean? It's a tricky one, isn't it? How am I supposed to approach this woman? What does it, the first thing that came to my mind is probably the first thing that came to your mind. She has lost a child. Would you go to a woman and ask her, is your child dead? Of course not. Can you imagine the damage you could do? So I prayed and prayed and prayed, and what I felt the Lord putting on my heart is just wait, wait for an opening. And after the soaking, I went, she was with her friend, and I went to the both of them, started just casually talking to them and I could you know, uh, ask her a casual question like, do you have a family where you come from? And she started crying the moment I said that. 
And then she told me that she had one child, a son, that she had to leave behind from where she came because she came to Iceland to work for six months. She had to leave her little boy behind with her parents. And she cried herself to sleep every night because she missed her boy so much. And she cried and cried and cried. Every night she went to sleep because she was missing her child. Then I told her the vision. And for that woman, you should have seen her face, knowing that Jesus is with me every night I go to sleep. He feels my hurt. He sees my tears. He is with me, and he is taking care of my child, and he's taking care of my heart. Mm. For that woman, it was like a million dollars, a blessing, a confirmation that my God is with me taking care of me and my child. You see how easy it, it can be to do the wrong thing when it comes to the prophetic and how beautiful it can be when we do the right thing. So I would like to encourage all of us. Bow to him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask him, Lord, what are you saying? Submit to your pastors. Submit to the leadership in the church. And have a great day. There's a reason why not. There's a reason why not.